the gathering of archaeological evidences and the thorough rereading of the existing historical studies on the Kaaba. So the book gather all these different materials and it would be already sufficient to produce a good book just by doing this work of gathering all these different uh, resources and materials. However, now I'm addressing you, Simon, uh, you take this research at another more profound level by giving us a more sensitive and enlightening critical interpretation of the material. Um, you make sense out of this material in the sense that your book is also a genuine hermeneutics of the Kaaba. You interpret, you read, and you have insights and you have your own view and interpretation of this material. And that's what that's why um, this book is so interesting. However, there is another most important reason why this book is exceptional which is that it finally feels an immense lacuna in the field of Islamic art studies. Indeed, since the fathers of this field declared that the Kaaba is not a work of architecture or work of art in any artistic sense, and therefore it's not an object of interest for art historian, the Kaaba has been left unattended as an object of art historical studies per se. In other words, the Kaaba has been excluded from this field. Well, there are two, uh, basically two facts that are telling of this, this uh, state of affairs, this exclusion. Astoni First of all, astonishingly, the book is published as a standalone instead of being inserted in the uh, university, the uh, Edinburgh University Press, a prestigious series on Islamic art history. It's a standalone, so that it's it's great because it gives, it it has enhances the exceptionality of this book. But I wish it was part of this series because it's uh, the the one of the main point of the book is to um, to regive the Kaaba its status as an artistic object, as an object of art history interest. The second fact is that the kiswa, the piece of clothes that cover the Kaaba, that rightly fall under the sign of textile art, the, ka the kiswa has been and has been studied by art historian, but as an object separate from its support, the Kaaba. Uh, the, in, in his book, Simon tells us that we cannot separate the, Kis, the Kiswa from the Kaaba and that the situation in which on one side the Kiswa is studied by an uh, art historian and the Kaaba is studied within the field of religious studies, we have two special, separate specialism, um, give us an idea of how, how um, kind of uh, difficult situation we are dealing with here. And um, uh, Simon is correcting the situation of separation, which is absurd because we cannot separate the Kiswa from the Kaaba. Um, moreover, so in this book, not only you correct this state of affair that was uh, uh, something uh, a little bit absurd, we may say, uh, but also with this book, you bring the Kaaba back to life, literally, back to life in itself, in the scholarship, for especially for non-Muslim people who do not realize the importance of the Kaaba. You bring it to life because the Kaaba is not only a work of art, but it's, it's a sort of living entity. Um, what I mean is that you unravel the life that it has that the Kaaba has both uh, for the Muslim cosmology itself, which is an, a living entity, it's something full of energy, active, but also the Kaaba is part of the faithful existence itself. And it's in this sense, it's also a living entity, something which is always there and that governs the life of the faith, faithful. And you show that very well in the book. So you do re-give the central place uh, that it ought to have, uh, in the, the Kaaba ought to have in the Muslim world, it has in the Muslim world, but from the scholarly viewpoint, uh, because of this exclusion, this absurd exclusion of the Kaaba from art historical interest. So, um, 
another uh, le uh, uh, less um, less final point that I want to uh, to enhance to underscore is that also you show how the Kaaba is the pivot articulating all the metaphysical, intellectual and material planes of the Muslim culture at large. All this said, let us proceed and I will ask you a couple of questions that I would like you to respond, to answer, to which I, I would like you to respond. So my first, my first question is, um, can you tell us a little bit about your journey, the journey that led you to study the Kaaba? Simon. Valerie, thank you very much. Um, wonderful introduction. Before I thank you kind of more so in a more copious manner and address your question, I would just like to also make a word of thanks to Katie, Katie O'Reilly Boyles, who is the project officer yeah. for public and policy engagement and knowledge enterprise at SOAS, who kindly suggested this event and has organized it and arranged it and kept us together and um, so a very large thank you to, to Katie. I have to say an even larger thanks must go to you, Valerie, for stepping in to do this um, uh, interviewing role. And I, I'm immensely grateful that you've taken the time to read the book and to, um, uh, to, to say such lovely things about it in that introduction. Um, you know, I'm a huge admirer of you. I, I, I just love your latest article that you've published on Aporia. And uh, I'm immensely touched that you would take time out of your uh, important work uh, ongoing important work into ornament to uh, to help this event become something of use to the participants uh, who are attending. Finally, I'd also of course like to thank everyone who has uh, signed up and come to this webinar. It's uh, very uh, it's very nice of you to, to 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 have done so. I don't have the list of the participants. I probably could see, but um, maybe if I saw who the names were, perhaps I'd lose my confidence or. Uh, get a little bit anxious so I'm not looking at those but um, maybe I'll see those later. Anyway I would like to say thank you to everyone for tuning in and um, now I'm going to uh, return to uh, uh, Valerie's question which was about the journey that led me to study the Kaaba um, uh, and that's quite a, it's a good question to answer because it's quite straightforward. In 2010 I received a fellowship uh, at the Kunsthistorische Institute in Florence to research a topic of Islamic sacred geography, namely the alleged relationship between the Kaaba in Mecca and the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. When I started that uh, research project, I was surprised to find that little had been written about the Kaaba in Islamic art history. And so I decided that I should just address the lacuna by concentrating on the Kaaba alone. Um, that is to say, I dropped the relationship part. This was just as well I've since come to find because in my belief, the Kaaba's relation to the Dome of the Rock is more alleged than factual, more, more, more putative than actual. Um, so in some ways, uh, it's been a benefit that I dropped the second part of what was originally the origin of this project, which was to study the relation between the Kaaba and the Dome of the Rock. Um, anyway, that's how it began in 2010 with that research fellowship at the Kunsthistorische Institute in Florence. Very good, very good. Yes, so um, <coughs> you make actually you make a very important point in your book by defining the Kaaba as a work of art or architecture. And to do so, you redefine the notion of art itself. This is to me crucial, a crucial aspect of your book, as we are currently witnessing the endeavor to decolonize art history. The, this decolonizing enterprise in particular targets this notion of art invented, as we know, by Western art history. But this enterprise has more or less, um, is more or less cogently uh, conducted. Uh, for example, I recently came across uh, the work of some scholars who deny that art even exists in the context of Islam because art is a Western concept which doesn't apply to the Islamic context, where art making is a sort of natural gesture or something natural, uh, not something that is um, regulated, something that comes from within uh, spontaneously, we, we might say. So art is not really a proper concept that would apply to the to Islam. So there is uh, first issue is that um, this this interpretation uh, loses sight of the fact that um, the concept of art and aesthetics 
uh, comes from the uh, Greek philosophical heritage, antique Greek philosophical heritage, and this heritage is common to Islam and, and to the West. So art does exist in Islam. The concept of art is something that applies to uh, the aesthetic materialities that are produced in Islam. And thankfully, but we have to define how we, we the, 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 the point is that indeed we have to define and to redefine all over again what, we, what do we understand through this concept of art, uh, especially uh, to distinguish between, we have to distinguish between um, material culture, culture and artistic culture. Uh, these are two different things and we need to uh, investigate these this, uh, different categories. Uh, thankfully, you tackle this issue uh, very rigorously and plausibly by doing the more sensible thing to do uh, when you question a category, which is to provide your own understanding, to provide your own definition of this concept of art. Can you then explain to us what you mean by art uh, when you posit that the Kaaba is indeed a work of architecture, a work of art? Yes, thank you. Uh, very important uh, intervention. Thank you so much. Um, OK, well, without trying to make light of and ride roughshod over the important decolonizing debates about the term art, including the recent one spearhead, spearheaded by Ariella Aisha Azale in her book, Potential History, Unlearning Imperialism, personally, I still believe the term can be used so long as a definition, as you say, is given. Um, is my belief merely self-interest, self-preservation as an art historian, not wanting to um, uh, spite the hand that feeds me, um, cut off the hand that feeds me? I don't think so. I think it's more a question of remaining alive to the very thing that first drove me into art history, namely the ability of art to astonish and stop one dead in one's tracks. Well, from photographs alone, the Kaaba still manages to do that to me. It's utterly extraordinary. And it is so to millions of Muslims too, many of whom have left accounts of their very bodily aesthetic response to the building. But to answer your question about my understanding of the term art, in the book, I say that a work of art is a working of art, in that by translating the world, art enters into how we perceive the world. I could have added another less lofty definition that I find helpful for pre-modern periods, namely, art is the transformation of a material substrate into something almost immaterial, spiritual. The Kaaba, with its elaborately embroidered kiswa or robe, fits both definitions. Finally, uh, as to why I posit the Kaaba as a work of architecture, that's much easier. Um, I don't draw the elitist distinction that is embedded uh, deeply, I think, in art historical discourse uh, across the board, not just Islamic art historical discourse, between a building and architecture. Um, I should add that twice I've been asked in public lectures by senior figures if the Kaaba counts as architecture. Um, I found at the time the question to be odd. The second time I found it less odd because I had, I'd had it already addressed to me. Um, but I do, as I said, I find the question very odd and I find the answer to be absolutely self-evident. Yes, of course, because the Kaaba houses and holds. Uh, in that sense, it's, um, it, it achieves the function of architecture to house and hold. It's true that some of this housing is done in reverse from the outside, in that the Kaaba houses the Islamic world that is said to have unfolded from it, but it also houses in more ordinary ways too. Uh, and in this way, it fulfills its function as architecture. Um, so I, I hope that's addressed, I thought, uh, uh, your, your question. Um, thank you for, for allowing me to, to yeah, clarify it that. It, it does. Yeah, yeah, and, and this, is very, this is a great conversation for all of us as art historian or um, people trying to study art. Uh, we need to uh, investigate these notions, but not, uh, in my opinion, considering again, and that's a, a very, very important point, considering that uh, Islam and the West share 
this uh, Greek philosophical heritage that produced the notion of art, aesthetics, uh, we cannot deny that this is uh, part of the common heritage of Islam and the West to have an artistic production that has to be distinguished what we, uh, from what we call more, broad, more broadly uh, material culture. So you, you started to, uh, uh, to answer these, these multiple questions, complex questions, quite, quite uh, nicely, but I think we need to continue this conversation in our publication as art historian. So, uh, in the first three chapters, chapters of the book, you examine uh, the three fundamental, fundamental aspects of the sacred ontology of the Kaaba. So, first the Kaaba as Qibla, the Kaaba as na navel, and the Kaaba as substructure. This examination produces, for the first time, for the first time, I must say, in scholarship, a complete picture of the Islamic cosmogony because of this uh, de depiction of the Kaaba that you give now I feel that we are close to the completion of this uh, to, to, to understand the picture to, to see all the contours and details of this complex Islamic cosmogony this cosmogony, as you show very well, is governed literally by the metaphysical and physical forces of the Kaaba. This cosmogony, this cosmology, uh, Islamic cosmogony, is built upon a complex, actually a complex mise en abyme of the ancient house. And this ex ancient house exerts these forces in different ways because of this mise en abyme. So in um, there are metaphysical forces, invisible forces, and there are the physical and felt forces all together. So thanks to this amazingly detailed picture of the Kaaba, we now better understand how Muslims see and live the world, literally. Can you elaborate a little bit on this cosmogony, cosmology centered on the Kaaba, just to clarify a little bit concisely how this is working, this mise en abyme, this living, uh, li very, this cosmogony, cosmo cosmography also, full of energy, very living, and the, 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 the producer of this energy is literally the Kaaba. Yes, well, there are, there are two things there. One is the cosmogony and one is the cosmography um, uh, yeah. of the Kaaba. The cosmogony is, is a singular event in the sense it's where the world is, uh, in Islamic tradition, alleged to have begun. Um, the Kaaba is uh, said in very, very early Islamic tradition to be the matrix from which the world unfolded. It's the place where the world begins. So it's the cosmogonic center. Um, uh, uh, the traditions uh, alleging this are many and early and they predate the fewer traditions that allege the world unfolded from the Temple Mount, specifically the rock of the Dome of the Rock. Um, and I think that I can elaborate a little bit on what that cosmogony means. Um, uh, it means that it makes, it makes Mecca inherently substitutable uh, uh, by imitating the rituals related to the Kaaba and often actually building Kaaba analogues substitutes for Mecca can and do exist all across the Islamic world. Mecca is the center of the Islamic world and like all such centers, it can be replicated. So that cosmogonic um, uh, event is vital, I think, for one of the, it's, it, it helps it understand why we find Kaaba copies, analogs, um, substitutes across the Islamic world um, uh, from west to east. Um, Regarding the cosmographies that have been that have um, that are, that have been written about it, well, of course they they vary. Um, as they're not consistent across all times. But uh, the ones that I was most interested in were the ones where the Kaaba is dead center of the entire universe, um, and uh, they seems to be not just generating the world, but also uh, seems to be at least as it's represented, at least as the Kaaba is pictured in images of these uh, cosmographies seems to anchor the entire universe. So the whole universe seems to be uh, tied to and born from the universe. Uh, now that, as I say, uh, that's from cosmographic traditions that are written by individuals over time. But these early traditions alleging that the world was born from the Kaaba, that seems consistent at least in the early period. And they do seem much earlier 
than by at least 120 years by my reckoning than later traditions that also allege that the Kaaba, that the world was born from the dome of the rock. Those seem to me to be much fewer in number and later um, it strikes me that early on in the history of Islam, the Kaaba was understood as being the place from which the world was born. Um, uh, but, uh, but, but cosmographies concerning the Kaaba do vary. Um, and uh, I do touch upon the ones that I find more interesting. I can't, I don't pretend to have addressed every single cosmography that involves the Kaaba. Um, I, I, I address the issues of the cosmographies, of cosmographies that place the Kaaba at the very center uh, from which the world and the universe seems to spin out of. I'm not saying that every single cosmography has replicates that schema, um, but that is certainly a very, very popular and very widespread schema that we find um, uh, in the medieval period and onwards. Yes, that's why I'm using this term mise en abîme because we have a, a great vari variation, but still uh, the center, the nucleus is there and it's the Kaaba. It's a solid and tangible and intangible, both tangible and intangible nucleus of the whole thing that I would call a cosmogony and the cosmogony includes cosmology and cosmographies, uh, plural. Um, so that's a very interesting thing. So I'm using this term mise en abîme to, to, to express this complexity. Now, one of your findings that uh, I found particularly uh, enlightening and, and, and at the same time very surprising, this finding is that although over the course of history, the Kaaba was attacked and reduced to ruins and rebuilt all over again, um, you observed and cogently argue that Muslims didn't react in the same way Jews reacted to the destruction of the temple. Muslims didn't mourn these destructions with the same intensity and despair in particular than, than the Jews. So okay, can you explain a little bit uh, about this finding um, and how, um, how you compare for, uh, compare for us the two holy sites? Uh, how, uh, how did you come up with this very interesting finding? And I completely agree. I think it's very, your argument is very convincing. Well, thank you for thank you for that uh, confirmation of my argument and also of course for the question um uh, when i'm talking about the um the, the temple i should be I, I know that the that it's not completely consistent there are some views a minority view within judaism that consider the, the destruction of the temple not to be quite as disastrous as for the most part it is considered to be in uh, judaism so I, i'll put that up as a uh, you know, there are competing views, but the majority view is that the destructions of the temple were disastrous and were the cause of, of great lament, hence the Jeremiah's lamentations. Um, uh, and uh, it's not without interest that um, in the Old Testament, one of the comments that are given in uh, Jeremiah is that the uh, the fire reached right down from in the temple from top right down to its foundations and destroyed everything. Now, I say that's important because I, I give four reasons as to why the um, why Muslims don't have a, an, a kind of equivalent to lamentations in uh, Islamic history. There isn't equivalent to Jeremiah's lamentations, and that's simply because uh, the, the the Kaaba is there. Are there are two primary reasons for this, and I'll share. Uh, now, there are four, but two are two are quite conceptual, which I won't go into now. But I will give two that are more um, uh, empirical and relate directly to. Uh, hadiths. Uh, and the first is that the prophet uh, provides very precise details about what is to happen to the Kaaba come the apocalypse. Uh, those hadiths, those details have served to, re to reassure people witnessing the attacks on the Kaaba, which as you say have been many over the history, that the world is not about to end. And so they don't, you don't get that kind of lamentation quality because people watching these attacks or hearing about them uh, can compare the details of those attacks with the hadith details provided in these um, eschatological apocalyptic hadiths and can say this is not the end of the world. So that's one reason. Uh, the other reason um, also related to hadiths and traditions um, is that uh, the substructure of the Kaaba, its foundations matter as much, if not more, as the superstructure. Uh, and those foundations have never been reduced to ruins. 
And now in Lamentations, we say we hear that the, 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 that the far reached down so destroyed even the destroyed even the foundations. Well, you don't get that in uh, in in the Islamic traditions. It's uh, that's not what uh, we're told. The, the foundations remain, um, and it's those foundations that uh, can be rebuilt upon in terms of the superstructure. And it's those foundations that uh, provide continuity uh, to a world that is anchored upon the Kaaba. If the Kaaba is born of the, if the, if the world is born of the Kaaba, you might suppose that when the world ends, when the Kaaba is destroyed, I mean, the world would be rocked uh, and uh, shifted out of true. And I think the answer, the, re the reason why that doesn't happen is that these foundations are not what is destroyed, just the superstructure, what lies on top of the, uh, of the earth, not what lies below it. Yeah, yes, and to continue with this, your your, um, your description of this superstructure, a supranatural, and at the same time very natural, very tangible superstructure, there is another aspect uh, that distinguishes the Jewish temple in Jerusalem from the Kaaba, which is that the Kaaba is kind of living body, literally, uh, a, a structure, a superstructure, but also a living body, something animated somehow. This reasoning of yours allows you uh, to assert convincingly that the Kaaba is the unique product of the local Arabian tradition. So because of this uniqueness of the Kaaba as a body, as something that is filled with energy, that is also um, not controlled by, by mankind, it's something that is, which is full of divine energy, um, it's a unique uh, uh, local product from the Arabian Peninsula, from all its ancient traditions, and then Islam is bringing um, its, its, its final definition to this particular location, to this particular nucleus here in Mecca, in Arabia. So the Kaaba is a body constitutively, and it's also experienced as a body with the holy inner life. This body is covered by a piece of clothes that does not conceal, but reveals, on the contrary, reveals the Kaaba's anatomy, so to speak. Like the skin, as you say, and, and the, the metaphor is perfectly, very enlightening, like the skin covers and reveals the human body. Furthermore, it is a body because it performs all sorts of things, especially for Sufis, but not exclusively. The Kaaba rotates, flies, it raises supernatural beings and is animated by an irradiating lively forces inhabited by this void inside, in its inside. This void is not a placid nothingness, it's, it's a void that is a concentration of energy but it's a void and, and in this case and, and all Muslim and even non-Muslims imagine the Kaaba but we see the outside we see the Kiswa with this we see this body where we sense that there is something in extraordinary inside that we cannot see that we cannot detect we, we cannot sense in terms of form but we sense this in terms of essence and substance together but it's void it's unfathomable it's it doesn't have we cannot define it so could you offer more details about this uh, about the Kaaba as as a sort of animated body and how people um Muslims m mystics and non-mystics experience the Kaaba as a living body and this includes for example you you mentioned and it, it's it's very well known you mentioned that even uh, modern scholars like Abdallah Hamoudi whom I I knew um uh, gave us an account of his visit to Mecca and his uh, experience uh, at the Kaaba and he felt this sort of supernatural effects uh, something exceptional, something that the human being senses but cannot grasp rationally completely. It's beyond beyond what we can grasp with thought. It's a true, total experience. Can you give us a little bit of explanation about this? The Kaaba as a, as a living body, full of energy and with this void inside. Well, I, 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 I love what you've just uh, summarized regarding these bodily aspects of the Kaaba. I think you've um, done a wonderful job of putting forward 
a summary of, of, of what I've said and you've kind of extended them in exactly the right way uh, without embellishment, no, there's no embellishment there. Um, so I'm very, very grateful for that summary. I, but regarding specifically your request that I explain the difference between the two types of experience, mystical and non-mystical, yeah. I'm not sure that um, I'm able to uh, explain more about that difference. I mean, the response of the Kaaba by Abdullah Hamoudi, as you say, a, an anthropologist at Princeton, um, clearly verges on the mystical, even though he certainly doesn't uh, present himself as a mystic. Likewise, the response of the British explorer slash spy Richard Burton in the 19th century also verges on the mystical. Was he a mystic? Not that we know. Um, I think these and other, uh, and many, many other similar experiential responses to the Kaaba, uh, by, above all, of course, by Muslims who have left off the many, many responses uh, to the Kaaba, especially in the modern and contemporary periods. I think these and many other similar experience, experiential responses to the Kaaba return us to the early question of the applicability of the term art to non-European material culture. So often one reads in historical and contemporary narratives how beholding the cab has stopped this or that person dead in their tracks. Doesn't such an experience make a mockery of the academic categories, mystical and non-mystical? That person, I would argue, is in a state of awe. Should we intervene and call it religious awe? I don't think so. Um, their senses are riveted, full stop. As the poet, the German poet wrote um, ir irreligiously, I would add, he wrote, he said it irreligiously, every angel is terrifying. Uh, and there's something that, um, you know, I'm not sure that, I think, it, I think when, we, when, when you're before the cab, or at least according to these accounts that I've read, the distinction between mystical and non-mystical just doesn't seem to hold true. People are in a state of awe, um, terror in some ways. Um, and that is certainly a term that's used by a, the word terrifying uh, which I've used, which I borrow from Rilke, is, is a word that's found in, in the um, Andalusian traveller, Ibn Jubeir, who talks about hearts being terrified at the sight of the Kaaba. Um, and again, Ibn Jubeir is not known as a mystic. So uh, um, I think there's, I think we do need to do away with, or, or, or be much more alive to the fact that mystical and non-mystical, especially in Islam, where distinctions between Sufi and non-Sufi are always banded around as if they were kind of categorical um, dis differences, uh, needs to be uh, looked at very carefully, because it doesn't seem to hold for the Kaaba in terms of people's responses to it. Um, Yes, yes, I, I completely agree with you. Again, it's like these dualities, be the, the secular versus the religious and the profane versus the sacred, all these dualities that we are familiar with and that we conceptualize as clear cut uh, divisions or divides. Uh, this doesn't work in this context and all these categories are very fluid and very movable. Um, I, because of time, uh, I, I have a last question to ask you. Uh, it concerns your extremely compelling comparative analysis between the one-point linear perspective in Western culture and this extraordinary void inside the Kaaba, both being a mathematical zero point that functions as a cultural placeholder and matrix. This zero point defines and anchors the entire culture of the West and Islam respectively. So for the West is the one point linear perspective and, and, and for Islam it's this extraordinary void in the Kaaba, these zero points. I found this very interesting and this very true as well. Uh, can you just, uh, we will uh, maybe conclude on, on this uh, elaboration about the zero point, mathematical zero point of the Kaaba? Uh, well, again, thank you. You've gone, of course, Valerie being Valerie, you've gone right to the heart of the matter. And I think this is very, uh, for me, it's in some ways the most important point of the book, but it's also the hardest point of the book. It's also the hardest uh, uh, insight to try and substantiate. Um, the matter is complex. Uh, in part because of the risk of cultural reductionism has to be weighed and it has to be navigated. Have I, have I managed the process of weighing and navigating the risk of cultural reductionism? 
Well, I'm very flattered and very pleased from your summary of my argument that I seem to have done so. Um, you seem to have understood exactly what I'm arguing for. Um, uh, and yet you're not also saying that this is a very reductive view. Um, uh, no doubt others will have different opinions, but I'm very flattered, very glad to hear yours. Can I say more about it? Well, not in terms of empirical historical data. No, I can't. Um, the problem is that the argument I make derives from what you rightly call an insight. Um, as such, the argument represents one of the very few places in the book where I assert something about the Kaaba that cannot be substantiated by historical, archaeological, textual data. Um, the closest I get to providing such empirical data is in a footnote um, about the transmission of zero from India to the Fertile Crescent in the seventh century and Islam's rapid embrace of zero commencing in the second half of the eighth century. In that same footnote, I add that the first reference in the Fertile Crescent to the Hindu numerical system, although with no mention of zero, comes in 662 of the Common Era in a letter by the Archbishop of Kinasreen. Um, you know, that's as, as empirical as I'm able to go. And um, you will notice that I've, I, move into the, I move into analogy when I'm making my argument. I draw it into the conversation issues of calligraphic, of, of the calligraphic nukta, the point from which all letters um, are said uh, in, in Islamic letterism to derive. So Islamic letterism has often used to be called Islamic letter mysticism, but uh, increasingly that term is uh, outdated. Uh, subsequent to publishing my book, I should say I've become more alive to this uh, recent uh, writing on Islamic letterism, but um, too late for me to change my terminology. I call it Islamic letter mysticism uh, in keeping with Anne-Marie Schimmel, but uh, there's some very, very interesting, very, very recent work on Islamic letterism uh, being produced right now. Um, and um, this issue of the nukta, the, the point, the zero point of calligraphy, and I make analogies with that to the Kaaba. But again, this is analogical reasoning. I don't have more empirical, uh, historical, archaeological data to substantiate this argument that is built upon an insight. But it is for those of you who are listening, thinking, my God, you can't, Simon, you cannot be uh, talking about the Kaaba if you've got uh, these kind of uh, more obviously idiosyncratic interpretations. Uh, let me reassure uh, those people concerned about that, that, that this is one of the few places where I go out on a limb and make it very clear. I own the interpretation. I say it's my interpretation and I don't present it as being one that can be um, attributed to somewhere within Islamic tradition. Um, so thank you for asking that question. It, it seems to me to be a very exciting thing, at least I find it very exciting to think about the Kaaba in those ways, but I understand that it won't be everyone's cup of tea. Um, and uh, <laughs> we'll leave it there. Valerie, thank you so much for these great questions. Oh, well, thank you so much for your for your um, enlightening and very stimulating uh, responses. And I want to thank you and to thank very much Katie for organizing this conversation. I think it's great that we uh, expose uh, all this work that you've done to uh, the public so to 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 invite them to uh, read this uh, fantastic book that it was absolutely necessary we, we had to now this lacuna uh, in the field of art history is filled and we can we can um, continue to um, um, rethink we, we can rethink uh, what we do in with this um, perspective this new cosmographic cosmogonic perspective that the kaaba is always there governing everything and diffusing its energies everywhere we have to think about islamic art in this way as part of uh, a production of this world se centered on, on the Kaaba. And I do appreciate the fact that you have hermeneutics propositions that we can ponder. Uh, they are not um, uh, statements of truth. They are propositions that we can ponder. And this is part of the scholarship. And this is something that is dearly missing very often in the scholarship, I must say. Uh, we need to dare to propose um, hermeneutic interpretations to, to, to offer them for further criticism in the constructive way. So I'm very glad about, and thank you again, Simon and Katie for this um, conversation. I enjoyed presenting and asking you questions. Now um, it's, I think, uh, the time for the Q&A.
Um, so, Katie, you think I should uh, straight away um, read some questions? I mean, yes. So we've got some. We've got. Thank you so much, Valerie and Simon. And we've got some people who've who posted um, in the Q and A box. So, Valerie, I'll I'll leave it. We, we've got about fifteen minutes left. So. I'll well, leave it up to you. Well, you we you know, may I'm, not get through all of them, but I'll okay. I'll leave it up to you. Can are you able to see the Q and A box? Okay. Yes, yes, I am. I am. Okay, but, fantastic. Know, I, I don't want I don't want to do what people do is to choose uh, among <laughs> questions. But I want I you know I live in London, so I will I will follow the queue. I think. Okay. Most, <laughs> I think it's the most fair. I mean, I, it, I agree. I don't yeah. like this idea. You know, oh, I'm picking uh, this one and not this one. So okay. I will start with with the you know the first. Um, good afternoon. I'm a master's student in protection of the um, historical artistic heritage. The legacy of Al Andalus. My question is, is there any historical studies related related to uh, oh, what is it? I have a problem with the, the, the font, sorry. Yeah, it's so small. I don't, is is there any historical studies related to uh, Kaaba, Kaaba as architectural object and architectural uh, object of Al Andalus, like the studies of the relationship between the Kaaba and the Dome of the Rock? Uh, so I think is there something? Uh, are there sources? Did you find something in, in the literature, I guess, in the primary sources of Al Andalus that uh, relate that are related to the Kaaba? I mean, I, I'm thinking about Ibn al Arabi, of course, but. Um... Between the Kaaba as an architectural object and the architecture of Al Andalus. Um, yes, yes. I, no. Um, and I should say that that doesn't mean that such uh, studies or such data doesn't exist. I, I don't pretend to have written the last word on the Kaaba by no means. Um, so one could cast one's net further afield. I like to think that I've covered it quite far afield in terms of, especially the Arabic speaking, the Arabic writing world, to some extent the Persian speaking world, but there are areas of the world which I really don't address. You know, South Asia is just not, is only sort of marginally in the book. Uh, Al-Andalus one would expect to have, I would have covered being you know, Arabic speaking at this point, but um, uh, I can't answer, I, to Radi, uh, I, the answer I think is no, I, nothing comes to mind. Um, you're more than welcome to write to me. My, my address is at Saras and- uh, We need to proceed. Yep, we okay. Need to proceed because there are, there are so right, many yep. questions. I, I want to-, to Quite to right, right, quite right, right. As many as possible. So if we consider the Kaaba as a work of art, how does that transform the act of prayer that puts the Kaaba at the nexus? Does prayer become performance? If so, does that undercut what prayer might be? Perhaps herein lies the tension in art and religion. Um, it's a nice question. I, I, personally, I don't know that there is a tension between art and religion. And I think one, what's so interesting about uh, a relatively new development of religious studies is to think about material religion and, and look at just how religion is uh, absolutely anchored in material stuff, um, art, uh, we would call we would call it. So I don't know that that tension exists. Maybe it exists today, um, uh, but I don't know that in the past that it holds true. Uh, I don't think that prayer becomes, uh, I, if, if you think of work of art in terms of something like you might go and see it at the, uh, the Tate Modern, that's not my usage of it. My use of it is simply that it enters into how we perceive the world. That's my definition. Um, it's something that uh, forms so much about, I think, how Muslims see the world. It enters into how Muslims perceive the world. I go into that in, in, in more detail in the book. I haven't, I've deliberately kept away from talking about that today because I realized that if one opens up that subject without having all the data to hand, it can sound like this guy is uh, uh, appropriating our culture and making, what it, making of it what he wants. That's not the case. Um, so, but, when I use the word art, which Valerie has carefully asked me to, to talk about, um, I don't mean it in the way that you might understand it today, at what we find if we go to the Tate Modern. It's uh, simply, a, it is something that enters into how we perceive and see the world. Um, and it doesn't affect, uh, it, it, there's no contradiction with prayer being involved there. Um, but yeah. th thank you for allowing me to clarify that. Very well. 
Um, so uh, do you consider Kaaba a typology rather than a singular object uh, such as the alleged Kaaba of Najran or the small mosques of Southern Arabia that Barbara Finster called the cubical mosques that were modeled in the image of the Kaaba? Sorry, I missed a, another question. I will, I will ask it after. Uh Yes, I certainly think about uh, the fact that in the early, very early period, there, there were a number during the lifetime of the prophet, there were a number of Kaaba, a number of buildings known as the Kaaba, the Kaaba of so and so, the Kaaba of Najran, as you say. Um, and as you say, Barbara Finster talks about how in, in Yemen, um, cubicle, there are cubicle mosques. Um, so I do discuss this, but I don't go into the origin, the alleged origin of the Kaaba that a scholars have, have put forward. My study is anchored entirely upon, upon data from Islamic tradition, Islamic history, Islamic geographies, uh, which is why when I was talking about zero earlier, I made a very, I, 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 know, I, I didn't apologize, but I wanted to make it clear that um, the book is based upon uh, empirical uh, textual archeological data rather than uh, just me riffing off some a few ideas I've had. This is not about, uh, this is not built upon uh, uh, what Western scholars have said about the origins of Islam and the, and the, and the, uh, and the origins of the Kaaba, simply because we don't know them. Um, I do discuss this briefly in the introduction and then make my position quite clear that I'm, in, I'm in investigating what Muslims have said and thought and felt about the Kaaba, um, not its putative origin, simply because we won't know the answer to that. And we just go round and round in circles. And it's not the kind of uh, argument I wanted to have. Others do that and, and, it's, and they should. It's just not what I wanted to do. Um, yeah. Thank you for allowing me to clarify that, Atif. Yes. So what is the relationship of early mosque building typology and how, uh, and how did Kaaba and the enclosure influence Islamic uh, the uh, the early formation of Islamic architecture and enclosures. Um, uh, I don't know that there's. I, I think when it comes to mosque typology, you, you need to be looking at what took place in Medina at the Prophet's uh, at the Prophet's mosque, and it's really not to do with the Kaaba. Um, the Kaaba is it has an influence on. On, on the direction of mosques, in the fact that mosques are oriented towards the Kaaba. So in that sense, it's got something to do with the fact that the Kaaba gives mosques a very specific and very uh, definite um, orientation. But uh, in terms of its architectural influence, um, you don't see it, you, but you do, that doesn't mean that the Kaaba hasn't been copied, it's been copied I say endlessly, I mean, that's an exaggeration, but it has been repeatedly copied and copied in ways that we may not think of as copies today, copied in the sense that someone may just take the measurements of it and then replicate those measurements um, in, in a courtyard of their mosque. But that's, that is a rare occurrence. I'm thinking particularly of the mosque in Sankore in Africa, where, um, where the dimensions of the mosque form the uh, dimensions of the mosque's courtyard. But other than that, in terms of mosques, I can't think of the influence of the Kaaba on mosque architecture. I can think of plentiful examples of, of Kaaba copies or Kaaba substitutes or things that people called Kaabas, but not on mosque building typology. Um, oh, okay, very good. No, no, you answer thoroughly. Thank you, Simon, I think. Uh, uh, but we need to, want to, to try to cover all the questions. So another question. Until the 20th century, the Kaaba was full of holy relics and other stuff. Do you discuss this and why they were there? Uh, it's, that's Hugh. Hello, Professor Kennedy. Um, um, well, I'm just thinking right now, you know, because the question comes from you, I think that it must, you must, you must, you must, you you, know, you obviously know what you're talking about. And I can't think. What I know, I'm kind of trying to think what relics you're talking about. Off the, I, I can't think. It's not that there weren't things like um, hanging lamps or at least decorative lamps in the mosque in, in the Kaaba. We know about that, and they still hang today. Um, we know that there's a box in there, and that box can be dated also back to 19th century visitors. Um, but in terms of relics in there, I, 
I don't see that. Now I know that there is a very, there's an article that is uh, often cited by Avinam Shalom, who talks about the, about the Kaaba as a kind of a treasury, as a medieval treasury. Now, uh, you will see that in my book, um, or you know, you, you, you're not saying, but in, I, in my book, I discuss this because it's, I don't see the evidence for this. I, we know that in the origins, we know that when, fr from, from Islamic tradition, very early, we know that it is said that the prophet emptied the Kaaba of all of its cultic uh, stuff when um, he conquered uh, Mecca. And that cultic stuff doesn't seem to return. Um, uh, and the issue of where the treasury goes just isn't clear. And the treasury doesn't seem to even return to the Kaaba after the ninth century. Um, so this is a very, you know, I, there is ever there is I don't know where the evidence comes from that, that, that argues that, that can say that the Kaaba was this kind of treasure where, where, where cultic elements were placed that just doesn't seem to be mentioned in the travelers reports that uh, uh, that I know of from the 13th century that just nothing mentioned and if they do mention cultic elements it's cultic elements used to be here can at Huna they were here and now they are no longer um, but it may be that in the 19th century, something was placed in there and you're referring to that, but I don't know of any. Um, and uh, we'll be only too happy to be corrected, of course, and uh, uh, to pursue this in, in other ways. But um, so I do discuss the contents. It makes an important part of my chapter that talks about the emptiness of the cab. I make a discussion of just how empty this building can be how we can talk about the building as being empty. So I talk about what is said to have been in the Kaaba before the conquest of Mecca by the Prophet and what after the conquest of Mecca by the Prophet. You know, what is thrown out of the Kaaba? Um, and I look into what is then returned to the Kaaba. And it strikes me that from my readings, nothing is returned um, or very, very little uh, apart from these decorative lamps. But um, can yeah, I? If, I, if I may intervene because yes. I know this is a discussion. But yeah, even if there, let's let's imagine there there are a few objects. Um, these are just minor compared to the 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 the, the 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 power of the void, which is beyond the presence of this little stuff. This stuff there, it, it, it's it's a void because also the Muslims are not only very few people are allowed to enter. So the, there is a principle here is that there is nothing in there for the rest of the people to see. There is nothing to see, but the, there is an interior. There is something which is inside and that the, 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 the pilgrims and the people who are experiencing or have experienced the Kaaba, they sense they are taken by the power of this void inside of this inside that they cannot visit, they, they cannot they cannot enter. Uh, so this is very important. Uh, so uh, the, the stuff is kind of uh, uh, different things. I mean, that there are little little things or, or, or it it's, doesn't have the power of the void. It's we cannot there is no equivalence here. That's what I mean. Um, uh, but you know this is part of the discussions uh, of, of of the 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 readings the readings exactly. Um, I want to continue with a few questions as much as we can. Thank you, Professor Omea, for this presentation of your truly wonderful, long-awaited book. Selfishly, I was hoping to hear your thoughts on the relation between the Kaaba itself and those of its representations, many of which are reproduced in your book. I am particularly interested in the awe towards the Kaaba and how this translates or not in relation to the Kaaba representations and our expectations from them. Well, thank you, Khalid, for your question. I, Khalid, I'm looking forward to, I'm hoping you're still doing uh, your dissertation on the Kaaba with Barry. Um, anyway, it's very nice. Thank you for your kind words. I hope you're well, Khalid. Um, uh, it's true that uh, uh, I don't. I didn't discuss it today, and and I don't discuss the usage of these images in the book. I don't. I don't use. I don't discuss how they're used in pious performance. Um, uh, that is a topic, as you well know, that is being discussed by the likes of Christy Gruber, and then people, especially who are studying now, uh, Hiba Abid and others who are studying uh, the Dalai Lakhirat of Jazuli, where these, uh, where the representations of the Kaaba are, for example, rubbed, and there's evidence of possibly even kissing. Um, uh, so that the, the performative aspects of this of, of the material of the representations of the Kaaba is a topic that um, I don't deal with in the book, and as you say, haven't dealt with today. But it is a topic that, as of course you know, is being dealt with um, 
uh, by others, and particularly in, with regard to Jazuli's um, Delilah Khairat. Thank you for the question. All right. Um, did you know there used to be a red mound of soil where Gabriel asked Prophet, Prophet Abraham to stop and build the house of God, Kaaba? I will tell you what the red mound of soil. Please allow me to speak. Okay, no, well, well we don't have time for these things. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry, but the, the, the audience cannot cannot speak. We have too many questions. Um, please, thank you. I like Mohammed. Mohammed, why don't you write to me? I'd be only too happy, but um, yeah. oh, please, Mohammed, think... Mohammed Jaffer, um, please write to me. I'd only be too happy to, to have a conversation. It's, but it's just not that we're just running out of time. But Mohammed Jaffer, if you're listening, my email address is so20 at soasacuk. I'm only too happy to engage with you. Please write to me. I think we went the on a mosque. I don't know what you're saying, Mohammed. Um, we no, no one's calling it a mosque. Um, anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. All right. Okay. Well, let's, perhaps we've just finished. Um, Thank you so much for all, um, all of these questions. This was very interesting and prolong nicely the, con the, the, the conversation itself. And as uh, just let me make a last point is that we as as it is written in the title of the book, these are readings. So there are there are evidences that Simon gathered that are really solid evidences. But there is also this very important part, which are readings and it's open and uh, it, it opens a venue for future research. So I hope you understand this and you were taken by this beautiful this beautiful enterprise of Simon. I think this is a book that would for once deserves a prize, you know, that one deserves a prize, I think. That's my final word. Valerie, thank, thank you, you so start. much, Valerie. Yes, thank you. And uh, Simon, thank you so much um, for, for, for coming and giving us your thoughts. And I'm so sorry we weren't, we weren't able to get through anyone's questions, but yeah, I'll, I'll pop. Um, Simon, are you happy for me to put your email address in the chat? I've just put it in. I've just put it in. You've just so put it in. Amazing. OK. Okay, so if anyone has any follow kind of polite follow ups, then please, please feel free to get in touch with with Simon and um, I'm going to put the link um, to his book as well in, in the chat now. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us uh, on a Tuesday afternoon, wherever in the world you've joined us from. And Valerie, thank you so much. You did so much research into Simon's book and that was a fantastic set of questions. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to turn off, um, I'm going to keep the slide up, but I'm going to put some things in the, uh, in the chat now, but thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.